Welcome everybody, I'm Andy Marks of the Centre for Western Sydney and I'm really pleased today to be here with a special guest who I'll introduce in a moment, but this is one of our conversation series ahead of the New South Wales election. Um, and before I go any further, I want to just uh, show you this beautiful backdrop, which is downtown Parramatta. Um, you can see how it's changed so rapidly in recent years, um, but with change also comes a responsibility to acknowledge uh, our traditional owners as well uh, and pay my respects to elders past and present. But as I mentioned, uh, the election's coming up and if you're a political tragic like me, uh, you won't sleep for, for probably about the next three or four weeks and I don't think my guest will either um, too much. Um, we're in conversation with Chris Minns today, the leader of the New South Wales opposition. G'day, Chris. Andy, good to see you. <laughs> good to have you here. Um, and this is, as I said, part of a, a continuing uh, forum that we are conducting. The idea is to make sure, and this is incredibly biased on our part, we're on the side of Western Sydney, and we want to make sure both government and the opposition, who are the potential incoming government, of course, um, have Western Sydney fairly and squarely in their sights. And so that's what we'll talk about today. Um, now, um, Chris, to kick off, as I said, I'm a bit of a political tragic and you mm. and I live and breathe politics, sure. um, but not everyone in Western Sydney who has busy lives watches it as closely as you or I do. Mm. Um, what should they know about Chris Minns if you're in Western Sydney? Yeah, I mean, look, I've lived in Sydney my whole life. Uh, I live in Southern Sydney, so mm. in the electorate of Cogra. I grew up in St George. Uh, I've got three boys and I'm married to Anna, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, lives with me, obviously, in Cogra. <laughs> <laughs> and um, other than a brief period of time when we lived overseas for sure. a while, we're born and bred here. Okay. And yeah. so I guess uh, Cogra we can almost take on as a de facto part of Western Sydney. But what does it mean to live in the, in the suburbs for you? Well, I mean, it's everything for us. We really do understand the pressures of congestion, the need for infrastructure, and also a government, I think, in the state that has a bit of a plan, looking down the runway, realising where people are going to move to, yeah. how to make sure that the infrastructure is in place, and where will people work and recreate and spend time with their loved ones, uh, not just next week or next election, but, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. Yeah, that's right. It's about building aspirations. Uh, and look to that end. You can't live in the suburbs or anywhere for that matter in New South Wales, particularly Western Sydney, without having to contend with cost of living pressures. Mm. The price of everything's going up. Uh, and it's doubly hard in Western Sydney when you confront things like tolls just to get to and from work mm -hmm. uh, and all those other cost pressures. What's your plan should Labor get into office uh, to address that in Western Sydney in particular? <clears throat> yeah, specifically we've released a plan in relation to toll, yeah. so a $60 cap mm -hmm. on the amount that you'll pay on toll roads in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Now the reason for that is we wanted to make it targeted for people that live in Western Sydney and, for example, Central Coast communities mm -hmm. that have to get in their car to travel to work, that mm -hmm. might be underserviced by public transport infrastructure. 17 of the top 20 suburbs that don't have access to public transport are in Western Sydney. Mm. So the net result is that you have to use toll roads to get to work and see your loved ones. Mm. You'd know, Andy, that there's a cap on the amount that you charge per week on the Opal That's network, right. yep. but there isn't in relation to tolls. Okay. So we wanted to make sure that there was targeted relief for those communities. Mm -hmm. The second point here is I believe privatisation, particularly of utilities and monopolies, yep. mm -hmm. has gone too far. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a proof point, I'd say that when... Endeavor Energy was privatised, which is the distribution network. Mm -hmm. It's effectively a monopoly. You can't. There's not not two sets of wires travelling yeah. down your street. Yeah. We now know through independent research that super profits were charged on that 15% a year. So that's mm -hmm. 200 bucks a year, mm -hmm. mainly for Western Sydney families. Yeah. So I've just said, look, I, I think privatisation's gone too far. So that's going to become a little bit of a line in the sand, it seems, at the election. Would you say that's the case? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you know, perhaps you've got to give. Premier Perrette points for honesty, but he's saying, you know, privatisation is still on the agenda okay. for the New South Wales government. I am really concerned about the transfer of, in particular, big corporations and utilities to private networks mm. and then the on costs that they charge to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the government will say, no, no, you have to do that. You have to build, for example, toll roads and privatise it, otherwise you're not going to get infrastructure. Well, that, I mean, that's the point too, Chris. There, a lot of their criticism has been that we simply can't fund those big projects if we don't go down the privatisation route. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. And I think that in many ways they've been... Well, I don't think they put the full facts out there. Okay. Now, I'll tell you a couple. Firstly, M5 mm -hmm. East, 
been free for 20 years. Now it's got a $7.95 toll sudden, each way. Yep. More, more than that, actually. Mm -hmm. So big impost to use that toll road. That road will be paid off eight times over by mm. the life of its contract. Mm. Now, that's not user pays to build the infrastructure, like, for example, the Harbour Bridge. Yep. That's paying it off and paying it and off a bit and more. paying it off again. Yeah. 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 Now, all that money's collected, mm. sent off to a private company. Mm. West Connects, for example, uh, built for $21 billion, mm -hmm. sold for $20 billion, mm -hmm. but the state misses out on the $70 billion worth of dividends mm. that would have come, or revenue, I should say, yep. that would have yep. come from the ownership of that asset because it's been sold off to a private okay. company. Okay, so clearly a little bit of a different approach there and one that goes into the question of infrastructure, which, as, a, as I mentioned, will be a big issue. Um, the other really big issue, and this goes back to families as well, is around education. Yep. Now, uh, we're losing a report of one in nine new teachers within the first five years of them going out and starting their career. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of reasons for that. They might talk about yeah, administrative burden. They might talk about low wages, etc. We're also confronting this situation where you have new release uh, of land in suburbs like Marsden Park, and we don't have the schools with mm. sufficient capacity yep. uh, to, to address the need. So why are we losing so many teachers? How will Labor stop it? Yep. And why isn't schools infrastructure keeping up with the release of land? And what will Labor do in that space? Yeah, Andy, I mean, uh, this is of particular importance to yeah. me. I think that in terms of why we have a wonderful country and economy and society, mm -hmm. a big measure of that is the public education system in New South Wales. It means there's no limit or ceiling to what you can achieve in a place like Australia. Mm -hmm. Not many countries around the world can claim that. Mm -hmm. Where It doesn't matter what your parents did for a living. Yeah. Literally every opportunity is available Everyone to you in Australia. Yeah, yeah, you got your shot here. Mm -hmm. We've got to hold on to that. It's precious. Yep. My argument is that there's no replacing the teacher at the front of the classroom. Mm. There's no uh, app or machine or computer mm. or website that is going to change the animating yeah. part of education in particular. Well, if you get a good teacher, it can change your life. And, and, I, and I don't think it's a question. I wouldn't, and certainly in Western Sydney, I think we've got a lot of great teachers. Yeah. But they're not sticking around in a lot of cases. They don't feel supported. Is that sure. a wages question? And I know there's been a bit of debate about wages for nurses and for teachers and the government might accuse you guys of, of you know, taking the cap off and letting things rip, and then alternatively that they might have an approach that wants to produce more productivity and savings. But teachers, either way, which whatever the debate in Western Sydney, sometimes don't feel supported. Well, there's two things I'd say about that. Firstly, New South Wales is the only state in the country with the wages cap in place. Okay. Every other state manages to sit down around the negotiating have table, have a dialogue, yeah. and work towards um, a, a good outcome with mm. essential workers in the state. So that's important. Mm -hmm. The second point here is, and this is something practical that we can change. Mm -hmm. For some reason, close to 40% of the teaching workforce in New South Wales schools are on temporary contracts, okay. not on permanent positions. Yep. So if you're a young teacher and, for example, you've just gotten married you and you're thinking about yeah. getting financed to buy your first home, mm -hmm. it's very hard to go to a bank when they yeah. say, have you got a job next year? And you go, I don't know. Yep. So we want to convert 10,000 temporary teachers to permanent positions, okay. yep. offer them permanent roles, tell them we want them in the New South Wales public education system. Because mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. everybody can point to two or three teachers that literally change their lives. And Chris, we know as well, just the last question on this education piece, we know that, that the Victorian budget, the state government there committed uh, more money towards uh, building new schools than they have in New South Wales. Yeah. That, that, to me, seems uh, as though we're missing missing the opportunity to kind of get that essential infrastructure in place. How do we have situations again to go back to my earlier point, like Marsden Park, where mm. the, the houses are released and the schools aren't ready? Yeah, well, uh, there, there's really no excuse for it because yeah. you can almost pinpoint to the child how many people yeah. will have kids and move yeah. into a suburb once you yeah. do the land release. That's right. You say government says land release in this suburb, it's going to be called X, mm. like Gladswoods Hills or Gregory Hills or Marsden Park, whatever it is. Mm. We're going to have this many houses. You can, down to the single digit, how many sure. kids will be in there. Yeah. So we just keep getting it wrong. And, and is this a case too, and I don't want to blame one particular agency, um, but is there a need for more joined up government thinking? Um, in these ways, I think between it's, planning, education, etc. I think it's more than the New South Wales government of the day saying, okay. if we are going to have a big population increase mm -hmm. in parts of Western Sydney, mm -hmm. South Western Sydney and North Western Sydney, mm -hmm. we have to build the educational infrastructure yep. in place. As I said, Gledswoods Hills, about 8,000 people. Gregory yep. Hills, 6,000 people. Yep. No high school. Yep. Largely young families moving mm -hmm. in. So how can you say to them, 
we want you to move into these new land release areas. We want you to build yeah. a community. Mm. But by the way, there's no high school. Yeah, it's not fair, is it? Uh, I'm going to get to that question around uh, fairness as well. And this is a general point about infrastructure investment. And I'm going to look at arts and culture in particular. Uh, you know, everyone in Western Sydney, or despite the controversy, is very much looking forward to the powerhouse. It'll only be, you know, a little stroll down the road here. Fantastic facility. But there's an arts and culture scene across Western Sydney. Now, our latest analysis at the Centre for Western Sydney of Create New South Wales funding for last year found that less than 10% of Create's funding went to Western Sydney projects. How is that the case when we represent such a bigger share of the population? Why isn't Western Sydney getting its fair share of arts yeah. and culture funding? Look, I saw that report and mm. I've got to be honest with you, I was, I was surprised by it. I yeah. didn't realise that there was such a discrepancy between east coast or eastern yeah. suburb centric funding and emerging mm. new creativity in western sydney mm. so we want to work with organizations like yours to mm. make sure that we can get some fairness in relation to arts and culture spending mm. um, and there's also got to be a realization i guess an understanding that emerging artists are largely coming from these communities they are. because yeah. um the lived experience of uh these communities is more relevant and interesting and the art mm. that they're producing is of 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 you know, wonder and importance. It's to probably the state. a dimension of you too. Going back to our initial question about you know uh, about what you uh, represent and the things that you uh, are, are into, I think maybe the public's not really aware of the fact that you you have a kind of I guess an eye for arts and culture as well. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't know, but um, I, th there's no question that we can be doing more. Mm. And and by more, I mean, um, and this was an interesting thing that. The Whitlam government did, mm. and then and then even its its predecessor government, mm. the, the coalition government at mm. the time, which was supporting unique Australian voices. Yeah. So recitals of Shakespeare and opera, they're they're important. They're cultural heritage. Yeah. I, I'm not not knocking yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But we have to encourage unique Australian voices. So more local content. Too. Because yeah. primarily because in 50 years time or 100 years time. Mm. I'd love to think people are reading Hansard, and what, but they're not going to be. I'm sorry, Chris. I, I, well, maybe that. Look, I'll, I will. Okay, I'll look in the scrapbook and I'll have a look back. Yeah, they're not going to be. What they're going to do is to find out what life was like in 2023. Yeah, sure. They'll be referencing artistic and you need expression. That. And I think that's the point here: is that the infrastructure is very welcome, but we need to support those that are in backyards and in clubs and underground scenes in Western Sydney, producing great music, yeah, great art, original. Original creations, yeah. All right. Look, we're in the home stretch, and uh, this question really goes to the diversity of Western Sydney. Um, I think that we saw at the federal election how um, issues involving women, uh, the environment, sustainability, etc., became a big push, a teal wave. Maybe it's a less of an impact in New South Wales, but what would you commit to with respect to getting more women in politics and more culturally diverse people? Because a lot of people in Western Sydney speak different languages, uh, practice different cultural uh, practices, and they don't always feel represented in parliament. And yeah. How do you think Labor's going on that front? Look, I think well, mm. but we've got more to do. 48% yeah. of our candidates are women. 48%, mm -hmm. I think, of the shadow cabinet, so the eventual yep. cabinet, if we win, again, women. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, we don't go around popping champagne over that. Like, sure. it'd be ridiculous. Yeah. We're in 2023, mm. and of course, half... <laughs> Yeah. the representative leadership of the party should represent and look like the community that we yeah. hope to yeah. be elected by. You, okay. you need to have a team that looks like the electorate that you want to represent. But you, now, now you are in opposition and that means that you sometimes put a lens to government. How do you reckon they're going in that space? Um, well, not you know, not good enough by any, okay. by any measure. All right, okay. And I think, you know, we try and be fair. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not everything's yep. a, big, a big political war. My mm. sense is... That senior leaders of the government do want to do better, but for some reason, institutionally, it's just not able to do it. There are barriers to yeah. that. Okay, and that's something that's a commitment, as you said, naturally in 2023, you'd like to see taken forward. Definitely. Yes, if yeah. we win, well, I mean, our candidates are picked largely, and our our, yeah. our cabinet teams in place. That's what it will look like. But again, yeah. you know, it shouldn't just it shouldn't be this cause for celebration. Yeah. It should just be natural. Yeah, that's terrific. Look, um, last question, and we do this with all of our political guests. Uh, politics is a tough game. Uh, you, you wouldn't go into it for the money or the glory, probably not, right? No. Nope. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't go into it for you know, the time away from family, which is incredible, can be incredibly hard, uh, particularly uh, in the case when you have kids, etc. But it can be rough and tumble. And what do you do to blow off steam? What do you do to just forget everything? We've had all sorts of answers. Some people play tennis. 
Some people run screaming into the, into the night, right? Yep. What do you do? Um, I try and get to the beach as much as I can. Yeah, okay. either with my my oldest boy who's uh, fourteen, or this morning Anna and I went for a swim down at Cronulla. Yeah, so we live you know in southern Sydney, yeah. so yeah. we just try and get to the beach, not normally on the weekends, but before work or after work. Good stuff. Yep. All right, listen, uh, I want uh, to thank Chris for coming down and, and sitting and talking with us about Western Sydney. As I said, there's a big contest looming in the election. A lot of it will be decided in this region. Um, we have extended an invitation to the Premier to come and talk to us as well. He'll so we do. He'll, 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 he'll do. How he'll could he not do it, no, right? No. Yeah. Let's get a date in. Come on. Lock in a date, on, uh, Premier. Uh, and we'll come back with more on Western Sydney ahead of the election. Now, one other thing I've got to get you on the hook on. Uh, will you come back if you win office around the 100-day mark and give us a Western Sydney address? I'd love to do that, but I'm, I'm not... Touch, Touch wood. wood. No, okay. I refuse to. <laughs> Good. Good. No. If I win, I'll be here. You'll do it? All right, <laughs> no. we'll hold you to that. That's okay. fantastic. Um, thanks again, Chris. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Andy. Good, Good on you, mate. All right. Thank you.